Mrs. Chisholm, ever since you decided you wanted to be a candidate for, for the presidency, it seems to me you've had a lot of arguments with a lot of people who don't take you seriously. And lately, at least, most of the arguments have been with black leaders. Who is your real opposition, the black community or the white community? My real opposition stems from a combination of factors in both of these communities. I think there are people in the black community and people in the white community who would not see my candidacy with any great deal of favor. And that is understandable in the light of the kind of society in which we are currently living. And I believe that uh, as my candidacy begins to move out more and more on the broader American scene, that many persons will begin to recognize that I'm a very serious candidate and that I have all of the other qualities that some of the other aspirants uh, who are running for this presidential office do have. From CBS Washington, Face the Nation, a spontaneous and unrehearsed news interview with Representative Shirley Chisholm of New York, the first black woman ever elected to Congress, who has said that she will seek the Democratic presidential nomination in 1972. Representative Chisholm will be questioned by CBS News correspondent Hal Walker, Paul Hope, political correspondent of the Washington Evening Star, and CBS News correspondent George Herman. We shall continue the interview with Representative Chisholm in a moment. Mrs. Chisholm, the Black Caucus finished a meeting here, a two-day meeting here in Washington just recently. During the course of it, you felt yourself, I think, excluded from some of the activities there. You got rather angry. There's a now fairly famous picture of you in a state of considerable agitation. Did you find that there was something political, or was this what women's lib likes to call male chauvinism? It's a combination of both of these things. First of all, in terms of the uh, women's liberation thing, I think people have to recognize that uh, women in this country are also saying that they have a great deal to offer in terms of their own abilities, their own intellectual qualities and capacities, and that they have been constantly per and persistently left out on the administrative and policy-making levels of this government. And just as the women's movement today are saying women want in on the top, Blacks are also saying the same thing. It happens that I am simultaneously a woman and a black person, and this is causing a great deal of concern. Many persons have to recognize that even though in their own inherent basic attitudes towards women in this society that they do not feel their place is in the political arena, they have to recognize that I do exist. And what happened this past weekend in the Black Political Leaders Conference is the fact that although I'm the only uh, black person currently who is saying that I am going to make a serious bid for the presidency, the, uh, the attempt not to even permit me to speak on a broad level at one of the two panels that were going to be discussing strategies for 1972, when all of the delegates would have been assembled at these two panels, is a subtle and a covert indication of the feelings uh, uh, towards a woman's candidacy. Male chauvinism is a, a real uh, problem in our society. Well, this conference indicated that the blacks are pretty well divided. Uh, uh, how, how can you be effective politically if, if you're divided? I don't think that the blacks are any different from any other ethnic group in this society. There are always divisions within the groups. I think one of the purposes of this conference was to really see if we can bring in together from all over this country people who are holding uh, important elective and appointive offices to map some kind of strategy for 1972. And of course you have differences of approaches and differences of opinions with respect to this strategy. Some feel favorite son candidacy, some feel lining up behind a single candidate, and some feel other things. And I think that we do have to recognize that there is no uh, unanimity of uh, of approach as yet uh, with respect to the strategy by black officials in this country for 72. Mrs. Chisholm, isn't the disunity that you talk about that went on at that black elected officials conference basically, does it basically boil down to a struggle between you and the backers of the Stokes brothers, uh, Carl and uh, Congressman Lewis Stokes, for, to determine who is going to be the power broker in delivering the, the votes of black people in this country? Since you mention it, let me just say this to you. I have said for quite some time now that if there's any black person that is going to emerge and wants to run for the presidency of the United States, that they should come out and say it forthrightly. That there's no necessity for reluctant dragons or persons uh, rumbling about the fact that they'd like to make the race and not make the race, but rather than to revert their attention towards someone, and in this particular case myself, 
who has dared to say, now here I am, I am going to make the race, I am uh, traveling in the country now collecting delegates and making inroads into the different segments of the society, into black groups, women's groups, Spanish-speaking groups, and other groups, and I am saying that I am a serious candidate. I've never said or I've never felt at any particular point that no black man, for that matter, who, doesn't, who wants to run should not run, but what they have been doing they have been holding back, have been acting like reluctant dragons, and then uh, proceed to try to uh, bring me forth as a person who is interested in poss possibly using divisive tactics. Now, that is very unfair, and it's very unreal in pragmatic politics. If you want to run, come forth and say you're going to run. Have the courage, have the guts to say you're going to run. But do not begin to try to thwart the ambitions of someone who dares to get out and do the nitty-gritty work that is necessary to make the candidacy become a viable one. A serious candidate could mean several things. Do you seriously believe that you can win? I seriously believe I can win, given the nature of the forces in this country today, given the nature of what is happening. And permit me to say this, that you must remember that I did not project or initiate my own candidacy, that my candidacy was initiated by a cross-section of many groups of, this people in, of people in this country who are asking in. I have women backing me in this country. I have many blacks. I have many black males, who, those whose egos are intact, backing me. I have many young people in this country who are saying, Mrs. Chisholm, we didn't even want to bother to consider uh, thinking about presidential politics because we can't think the system can work, but we're willing to give you a chance. I have many Spanish-speaking people backing me. And all of these people about six months ago began to ask me to make this serious bid, and so I, have, I proceeded to move on the basis of this call. Is there a board or a committee? You, you referred in an article in the New Democrat to a coalition, and you said, I am the instrument of the coalition, mm -hmm. and, uh, and you indicated that you would do what they decided and what they wanted. Is there some group or committee whose advice and whose decisions you are following? I am following the advice and uh, decisions of several people from the different groups that I've just mentioned, but you must remember that I have not opened up my national headquarters as yet to bring together the coalition of the forces right here in Washington, D.C., the capital. I have groups in about 27 states. And hopefully on about December 3rd or 4th, we have just secured headquarters uh, space here in Washington, D.C. We will be officially opening our headquarters and coordinating all of the efforts and all of the forces. And at that time, uh, a, a, a press conference will be called to identify many of the persons who are associated with me in this movement. Well, you've never said positively that you are a candidate. Are you saying now that you positively are a candidate? No, I'm not saying positively I'm a candidate now. I don't, why, I don't know why I should be any different from some of the other aspirants. I'm still saying that as the momentum begins to swell and the fact that fundraising galas are being put together in this country and the forces are organizing more and more every day, that around January 3rd or 4th, if I am able to have at least $300,000, which is a minimal amount because I'm not going to enter every primary, I will be a definite candidate around January 3rd or 4th. The chances are... 99 to 100 that I will be running. Well, do, does it make any difference what the, what the other black leaders uh, decide uh, they want to do? You're going to be in it regardless? Yes, uh, I'm going to run regardless because, as I said, I, have, I was uh, first projected by a number of forces five or six months ago. I also happened to be black. But persons have to really recognize that I am also a woman, and this is what is disturbing many of my black brothers, because in the post this morning, one of them said, we do not want black politics mixed with women's liberation. Well, heavens, one of their outstanding black politicians in America today happens to be a woman, and I cannot get an operation to change to be a male at this particular point, and they have to recognize that women are human beings. And that is a part of the problem that many of them are having difficulties with. They don't want to say it openly. But we know in terms of what has been happening this past weekend and in terms of what many of the delegates were saying at the conference, that this is a real problem of an attitude towards women in politics. It's applicable to black males and it's applicable to uh, white males. It's a real Better problem. or worse? Pardon? Better or worse in one group than the other? I don't know if you'll say it's better or worse, but let's put it this way. Because of the role of, that the black woman has played in this country for such a long time, and because of a society which had projected her into a very assertive, <coughs> dominant role because the men had been emasculated for so long, she has a certain reservoir of talents and perseverance that she's been able to bring to many fields of endeavor. And of course, when you have a black woman like myself, who is a very assertive woman, 
who is a woman that has confidence in herself and her abilities, moving out here, it is a threat to some of my brothers whose egos are not particularly secure. And I recognize this. And I do want to say that I did not, we didn't have this convention this weekend to endorse any candidate. That was not the purpose of the convention because people have to do what they have to do. But all I'm saying is that they have to be a recognition that Shirley Chisholm does exist and that you must not try to use maneuvers to bypass her. That's all I'm saying. Mrs. Chisholm, isn't the whole idea of women's liberation also hasn't it been received with a certain amount of coolness by black women who are concerned about male, black male egos. And don't you run some danger of alienating both black women as well as black men? No, I think that's a very uh, erroneous thing because when you have women like Fannie Lou Hamer and Merle Evers uh, and Dorothy Height being a part of the, co uh, the policy council committee of the National Women's Political Caucus, and these women do represent black women on different levels in the American society, one has to indicate that in the women's liberation movement, there are aspects of that movement that are very meaningful to the black woman because she is at the very bottom of the ladder. It doesn't mean that the black woman has to accept every platform and every plank, but when the women's liberation movement in this country has such a thing as national daycare centers as a part of their total platform, that plank is very meaningful to black women. And what black women have to learn to do is to accept those planks or those uh, postures of different organizations that will be very meaningful for them in this society. But what is wrong, actually, the thing that is really very wrong is that when you use the word women's liberation, it evokes certain negative things in the minds of people. And that is very unfortunate. One of the well, women you mentioned, I'm sorry, uh, was Mrs. Medgar Evers. And um, Mrs. Evers, as you know, has endorsed um, Senator Muskie. It, do you consider that, in any sense, a blow to your own candidacy? No, I don't consider that a blow to my own candidacy, because whoever said that every black woman is going to support Shirley Chisholm, whoever said that every black man, every white woman, every young person, every Spanish-speaking person, every one of the, dem the Democratic uh, candidates are going to have people from these groups, that's not a blow to my own candidacy. I can't expect, merely because a person is black, he's going to follow me, body and soul. That would be a very erroneous thing uh, to, to expect. How, how much clout do you expect the blacks to have at the convention, and, and what are you going to demand if you, if you do have some clout? First of all, the blacks have to come up with the strategy that they have been talking about, you know, for the past uh, six or seven months. First of all, you can only talk about the blacks having clout at the convention if they do come up with a strategy that's going to be uh, able to coalesce most of them into a force to be reckoned with. Secondly, uh, in terms of my own candidacy, because I, I, I do have and do present a coalition candidacy, uh, it will mean that I will be going to the uh, convention with clout, irrespective of what other groups might do or might not do. Well, what do you expect to demand at the convention? I expect to have a very, very important role in saying what the total ticket is going to be to look like. I expect to have a say in terms of cabinet members. I expect to have a say in terms of some of the things that blacks and women and Indians and other groups have never really had any input into a democratic convention. I expect to have a great deal of say into saying what the next administration must look like or what it must address itself to. Should it have a black woman named Mrs. Shirley Chisholm in the cabinet? That will be dependent on all of the, the people who are backing me at the convention as to whether or not they feel that this is a role that I should play. I, I'm constantly saying that because I want everyone to know that I am not running to become a vice president or to become a cabinet member. I am running very seriously to become the president of this country. And so therefore, I am not interested in discussing this uh, from any other standpoint, but I also have to be a pragmatic political realist and realize that this might arise at the convention. You've uh, stated your opinion of not on the show, but in, in press and, and published uh, in the past on many of the other candidates. But on Senator Muskie, you have a rather balanced, uh, almost equivocal thing. You say you don't like what he said about the uh, impracticality of running with a black vice president, and yet you believe that he can still retrieve his position if he were to meet with the black leaders. Can you expand on that a yes, little bit? Yes, I'll be very glad to expand on that. First of all, with respect to the statement that he made, perhaps uh, Senator Muskie did in truth and with utter candor mention the fact that he didn't think that uh, a black person on the ticket could be helpful. But it was not a question of utter candor or frankness. It was a question of beginning to prepare this country, beginning to prepare this country to uh, 
engage in attitudes of the fact that a black person can be on the top level mm. or in the administrative role in this country someday on the national scene. You have to make that comparison also to the Southerners who for many years felt that civil rights shouldn't go to, uh, shouldn't go to black people, but yet Southern leaders began to move in the direction of, by giving the leadership, it's a question of moral leadership. The reason I said that he might be possibly able to retrieve some of what he said is because his campaign staff and the forces around him are beginning to move in the direction in terms of some of the most recent statements and some of the meetings he's been having, and of course in, and also on the employment of Mr. John Dean, who he's been moving around the country, to see if it can be reconciled. And uh, this is why I said that there's a possibility that he might be able to retrieve some of what he said or felt. Would to you the sir? point where he would uh, possibly get your backing? I am running for the presidency of the United States, so I don't know how he's going to get my backing. Well, if you don't get the money that you say you must have in order to make this affirmative decision. At the appropriate time, it will be clearly indicated whom I would back. Will you support the nominee of the Democratic Party? I do not know whether or not I would support the, support the nominee of the Democratic Party, and this has been the position of several other persons who are also running and uh, aspiring for the Democratic nominee, because we don't know who that person is going well, to be. George Wallace emerges. I certainly couldn't support him. Well, you're, you're a uh, National Democratic Committee woman from New York. Uh, don't you feel some obligation to support the party? I'm a National Democratic uh, Committee woman from New York. I supported uh, Mayor Lindsay when he ran for the mayor of the city of New York. I supported other, other persons who were not the the nominee for our party at certain conventions. That's not, that, that's not the issue because ultimately my being the National Democratic Committee woman has to stem from the votes of the delegates at the convention. I became the National Committee woman because of the votes of the delegates, not because of the votes of political bosses who never wanted me in this position in the first place. Mr. Chisholm, on some of the basic issues that you, I'm sure, will be talking about, aside from women's liberation, your support of uh, minorities, how do you feel about, what will be the effect of um, William Rehnquist's um, confirmation as a Supreme Court Justice? Well, I believe that William Rehnquist's confirmation uh, by the Senate for the Supreme Court would be an indication of the direction in which the, uh, the Nixon administration has been moving for quite some time with respect to appointees for the Supreme Court uh, bench. The scenario has been written, has been going on for quite some time. Each time certain persons have been projected. You have uh, libertarian forces in this country that have appeared before the committees and given their testimony. And I think that Re William Rehnquist's nomination would further indicate that the, uh, the executive branch of government certainly seems to have a commitment to making sure that it puts persons with extremely conservative points of view, persons whose uh, positions on civil rights issues in this country leave much to be desired. It will be no deviation from the script that has been written by the White House. Will you work against it uh, in the few days that remain on the subject? I certainly will. Do you think you have any chance? I do not know whether or not I have any chance, but I will continue to do what we did when we went against uh, uh, Judge Carlswell's uh, no nomination. Why, let me get back to politics for a moment and ask you why you've decided that you want to run on the Democratic Party ticket. Why you did not decide to strike off in a new direction. Because many persons within the Democratic Party structure, persons who have been Democrats all of their lives, mm -hmm. said to me that they're willing to give the mm -hmm. system another chance by working within the system to see if they can't bring about change at the national convention. Because it has been my humble belief that if we're going to bring about change, that we still can bring about change within this system. I really believe that. I believe that we can make this system responsive. But you're not going to be able to make the system responsive unless you know the weaknesses and the strengths of the system and be on the inside to know where it is that you have to strike. And so many people, and you'll be surprised that many of the regular Democrats who have not been over yet in endorsing me are saying, Mrs. Chisholm, since you have the courage, because most people don't have the kind of courage that I have, let's face it. I take a, a political, uh, I, I'm playing with my political life, and I recognize that I am, but I feel it is so important in America that somebody has the courage and the daring to do this, that on the basis of many Democrats that people really do not know about, and many of the people out there who give the votes to the delegates, I'm not talking about the elitist uh, boss uh, politicians on the top level. I'm talking about the people who said to me, Mrs. Stitchum, go into it as a Democrat and let's see what we can't do. Along that, along that line, though, you've been asked to enter the Florida primary on the Republican ticket. Have you given that any serious consideration? I have considered it only insofar as I'm flattered that there's such a disgruntledness in the Republican Party that they dare to even ask Mr. Chisholm to consider entering the Republican Party. Of course, I will not be able to enter the Republican primary. <laughs> Can the system change faster than the American people? As you know, there have been a lot of reports, surveys, polls, and so forth, which show that the American people 
just at the voter level, have been changing it with remarkable speed on many of their prejudices, class, race, and others. Do you agree, and do you think the system is responding to the change in the population? The system is responding on certain levels, and it is not responding on other levels. That is why it is so terribly important to have a change of administration. When, our, when President Nixon uh, was inaugurated, he spoke about bringing us together. And yet in terms of what the president has done, he has served to alienate so many factors in, in this society. It is my humble belief, although some persons disagree with me, that perhaps the president really wants to bring us together. But the president of this country cannot bring us together with the kinds of advisors and the kinds of persons that he has around him in his advisory cabinet and as the head of his different cabinet departments, because these persons have no sensitivity or no real attunement to the needs and the cries of poor people, black people, Indians, Chicanos, women. They have no sensitivity. And they believe that so many of the outcries that are occurring in American society today are coming from, so, from what many of them euphemistically call the radical elements of society. Well, I wish they had an opportunity to travel with me through this country and see who some of these so-called radical elements are. They're some of the most conservatively oriented people who feel that this nation is not addressing itself to the domestic issues and the domestic crises that are causing the morale of the people at home to fall day by day. Do you think most blacks want to work within the system? I believe that a large number of blacks in this country want to work within the system. If the system will just stop uh, dealing in cliches and rhetoric and begin to implement the laws on the books, we have, we have enough legislation and enough indication to indicate that the basis is there, but it's men. And that's why the administration has to be changed. Well, is, 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 uh, is anything any different in Congress? Uh, I mean, you're criticizing the other end of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Avenue. How about Congress? Oh, Congress has its share of the burden to bear also. There's no question about it. When you can uh, read a book like Nick Cox's book, Let Them Eat Hunger, and see from that book what the appropriations and author uh, authority uh, committees in the United States Congress has to do with monies for poverty programs, agriculture programs, and food programs, you realize that it's a big fraud because the heads of the committees who control these programs, which are the lifeline for poor people in this country, are people that have basic inherent racial attitudes towards Indians, poor people, and blacks in this nation. Can anybody, no matter what handicaps or what advantages, do you think, defeat President Nixon in the coming year. After all, he'll have China under his belt. He'll have phase two, a considerable change in the rate of inflation, which most people seem to think is doing mm -hmm. some good. I presume you mm -hmm. agree somewhere. Mm -hmm. Can anybody beat him? I think there's a possibility of beating President Nixon, but this is going to be very much What's determined. What's the gut issue? I think the gut issue is the whole domestic state of affairs at the time that the conventions begin to get over, uh, underway. How the American people are reacting at that time to what is happening to them. Because for such a long time they have been reacting in a very, very upset fashion because their taxis have been used for uh, the, the, the propagation of a, a war in Vietnam. Their, the kinds of programs that has to do with services to people in this country have been cut back in the United States Congress. When you speak about uh, law and order, there's been such a kind of repression, not only on blacks, but certain whites in this country because they dare to dissent and talk about the inequities of our system. So to the extent that the American society at that time is still in ferment about what is happening to them as citizens of that land, the, the whole domestic crisis, the whole domestic situation, I feel is going to be the most important thing in the campaign for 72. Is law and order a legitimate issue? Law and order is not a legitimate issue at all. Law and order is an issue behind which many people love to rally because of what those two words connote, law and order. Everyone wants law and order in a society. You can't have anarchy in a viable society, but you cannot have law and order without justice for all kinds of Americans. That's the key, and nobody talks about justice. All people talk about is law and order because it connotes certain things in the minds of people when they hear those two words. Law and order without justice is part of the reason the American society today is in ferment, not only with blacks, but also with many whites. Whatever the issues are facing the Republicans, the weaknesses that the Republicans have, uh, given the disunity now in the, in the total Democratic Party, and going back to the problems that you've had in this uh, recent mm -hmm. conference, could you not do the black people a favor by withdrawing in order to gain a certain amount of unity among blacks? It's not a question of my withdrawing. 
It's a question of the fact that Shirley Chisholm is not a, pre a presidential candidate of black people alone in this country. Shirley Chisholm is a candidate of all kinds of people. I am an American. And blacks and whites and young people have asked me to run, and this is where the mistake is constantly being made. This is my land also. This is my country also. And I'm highly flattered that there are forces in this country besides black that wants me to run. And then the question arises as to whether or not I'll be more for women or more for young than more for blacks, as some black officials feel I will not be that much for blacks. How dare they insult me when I have been the one leader in this country that has taken stands on very controversial issues that many of them would not dare to take because it's not politically expedient to do so. I am a candidate for American people, including blacks, women, and other groups. Thank you very much, Mrs. Chisholm. We've run out of time. Thank you very much for being with us on Face the Nation. Today on Face the Nation, Representative Shirley Chisholm, Democrat of New York, was interviewed by CBS News correspondent Hal Walker, Paul Hope, political correspondent of the Washington Evening Star, and CBS News correspondent George Herman. Next week, another prominent figure in the news will face the nation.